Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the organizers for uh, this kind invitation. So today I'm going to talk about diffusion modeling and uh, microstructure probing, and I have nothing to declare. So the aim of my talk is basically to give you an overview of modeling approaches for diffusion MRI that go beyond the standard techniques such as ADC mapping and DTI. And uh, this talk is organized as follows. So in the beginning, I'll give you a quick introduction of how we can probe tissue microstructure using uh, diffusion MRI. Then I will uh, briefly mention the um, standard techniques of uh, ADC mapping and uh, uh, DTI. And then I will go into the higher order models as well as um, diffusion models of uh, tissue microstructure, which is actually the focus of, um, of my talk. In the end, uh, I will briefly mention some current trends in diffusion MRI modeling and um, acquisitions as well. So um, the aim of microstructure imaging, as El said as well, is to provide a non-invasive characterization of tissue properties at uh, the microscopic level. And diffusion MRI is a modality of choice for this because the signal is sensitive to the displacement of the water molecules in the tissue, which is affected by the presence of uh, cellular membranes and their configuration. And uh, this reflects features on orders of magnitude smaller than the actual um, image voxel size. Uh, then if we want to extract information regarding the tissue from um, the diffusion MRI data, we need to assume some properties of the diffusion in the underlying tissue. Then we need to find an appropriate uh, mathematical representation and fit it to the data um, in order to recover these features. There are various models that have different complexities and require uh, different acquisitions, as we have seen before as well. And these models also can provide sensitivity and uh, specificity to uh, different uh, tissue properties. Okay, so um, as we have seen in the previous talk, the standard diffusion acquisition is um, the state called Tanner sequence or the single pulse gradient or single diffusion encoding uh, that is late latest name we uh, settled on, and it um, contains a pair of pulsed um, diffusion gradients which are inserted um, in, for example, a spin echo sequence. And the simplest experiment that we can do is to map the apparent diffusion coefficient. This requires only one um, single uh, diffusion measurement. It assumes a single water pool. It assumes that diffusion is free and isotropic, which means it is described by a Gaussian propagator. And in this case, the signal um, can be written as a monoexponential decay, where B uh, here is the diffusion weighting factor and depends on uh, the sequence properties, on uh, the gradient strength, as well as on the timing of the sequence. The main limitation of the ADC is that um, actually it cannot model tissue anisotropy and also cannot explain the water compartmentalization in the tissue, which is also important if we want to be specific about uh, the tissue microstructure. Well, the anisotropy we can solve uh, pretty easily if we extend the previous uh, formulation to um, a tensor model, and uh, this is the well-known uh, diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, where the signal is written, again, in terms of the gradient strength and uh, the diffusion tensor, which is a 3 by 3 um, symmetric um, and positive definite uh, uh, matrix. In order to um, estimate the diffusion tensor, we need at least um, six uh, different uh, gradient directions. As we, you can see here, we have uh, six um, unknowns. After we estimate the diffusion tensor, we can uh, diagonalize it in order to get the eigenvalues, which represent the diffusivities along the principal uh, directions. And once we have the eigenvalues, then we can uh, recover metrics that are widely used in the clinic, such as the mean diffusivity or a fractional anisotropy. Okay, so um, why is DTI not enough? Well, DTI assumes that uh, we have a single water pool with uh, possibly anisotropic Gaussian diffusion. So it cannot really account for multiple compartments or restricted diffusion in the tissue, which um, we know it is true if we just look at the micrograph of the tissue. Also, DTI cannot account for complex fiber configurations, uh, such as crossing fibers, dispersion, fanning, which we also know that uh, are present in the brain. It also cannot really um, represent the measured uh, data over a wide range of B values. Mm -hmm. 
So basically, we really need more complex models to account for these effects. So um, in the literature, uh, a variety of modeling approaches have been proposed to overcome the limitations of uh, DTI. And um, some approaches model the deviation from the Gaussian diffusion and explain the signal over a wide range of experimental parameters. And then we can interpret the additional model parameters um, that uh, they indirectly reflect some properties of the tissue. We can also try to model the complex diffusion patterns in areas with multiple fiber configurations with techniques such as uh, diffusion spectrum imaging or um, cue ball imaging in order to obtain the diffusion orientation distribution function or spherical deconvolution techniques to get the uh, uh, fiber ODF. And these are really important for tractography. But we can also try to be more specific to um, the tissue microstructure and to basically assume certain models for uh, diffusion in different uh, compartments. And then we hope that the parameters that we um, uh, we estimate reflect uh, the different tissue properties. Okay. So let's start with the uh, diffusion kurtosis imaging, as um, Els Firms also mentioned. Um, it aims to capture the deviation from Gaussianity by including higher order terms in the signal model. And as we can see here, it definitely represents much better the measured data at higher B values. We can also extend this uh, to account for anisotropy in a tensor formalism. And uh, we have the kurtosis tensor, which is a um, rank four fully symmetric tensor with 15 independent components, which means that we need 15 additional, at least 15 additional measurements compared to DTI in order to estimate um, these parameters. And uh, we can see here that the radial kurtosis is uh, larger in the white matter. Um, areas, it was basically um, in regions where diffusion is more restricted. There are various uh, flavors of um, DKI, for example, um, Els Firman's work looked at uh, the white matter tract integrity model, which basically uh, aims to estimate um, uh, param in parameters such as um, the volume fraction of uh, the interaxonal space from DKI parameters, while Hansen et al. looked at the um, really fast way to estimate the mean kurtosis imaging with only 13 measurements. So there is a lot of research going on in terms of um, extending uh, DKI. Then a different approach is um, taken in the diffusion spectrum imaging. Uh, and as we have seen in the previous talk, there is a Fourier relationship between the displacement space and uh, the Q space. And uh, this is uh, true when we have a, an ideal diffusion sequence with um, short gradient pulses. So in this case, this is the acquired diffusion signal, and then uh, this is the diffusion propagator. So if we sample uh, the full three dimensional Q space, then we can recover the three dimensional uh, diffusion spectrum, which uh, reflects the uh, displacement. And uh, this is the basic principle of uh, the diffusion spectrum imaging technique, and uh, which has been used to extract the diffusion orientation distribution function. And if we look here, we can see that um, already the DODF basically can distinguish between uh, the peaks coming from um, uh, multiple fibers in areas with, uh, with, with crossing fibers. Um, however, the full coverage of the Q-space uh, in the, th of the three dimensional Q-space requires a really long acquisition with uh, several hundred measurements. So one good way to go around this is to um, use hardy techniques, basically to acquire a shell in Q-space uh, and to use a fixed um, Q amplitude and many directions. And this technique um, is known as high angular resolution diffusion imaging, or HARDI, and is actually quite a standard now for uh, diffusion acquisition. So once we have such a measurement, then uh, we can recover the diffusion ODF uh, through a technique um, which is called like cue ball imaging, uh, which obtains the DODF uh, from the diffusion data via funk radon transform of the signal. A different option uh, is to recover the fiber orientation distribution function uh, from a similar data set. And um, this can be done if we assume 
that um, the response from each fiber population within a voxel is, uh, is the same, and this can be the same across the brain or estimated in each voxel. And then we use a spherical deconvolution technique to get uh, the fiber orientation distribution function, which basically links the response function from each fiber to the measured signal. And uh, as we can see, the um, FODF provides sharper peaks than, uh, than um, cue ball uh, imaging. And uh, the, the applications to tractography will be discussed in the next talk, but this is very important for uh, this purpose. So now um, a different way of looking at uh, and modeling the diffusion signal is to look at multi-compartment and biophysical model, uh, models in order to try to be more um, specific. Uh, so we want to model the effect of different tissue properties on the acquired signal and also separate the signal contributions from two or more water pools. And we want to do this in order to differentiate between different tissue components as well as between uh, multiple fiber populations. And um, for the rest of the talk, I will look at uh, several popular um, methods to do this. Uh, for brain imaging, for example, we can look at um, multi-compartment tensor models, which assume Gaussian diffusion in each compartment. Then we can look at uh, models which account for restricted diffusion, uh, techniques that explicitly uh, take into account the uh, fiber dispersion as well as other effects. And then uh, I will also look at the recent developments of uh, these modeling techniques uh, for uh, cancer applications. So the simplest um, extension to a two-compartment model obviously is a bi-exponential function, which assumes two isotropic compartments with uh, different uh, diffusivities, and it can be fitted to the data acquired at the multiple B values. Um, it can be used to model slow and fast diffusion. Um, however, it, uh, the volume fractions that we obtain from such a model cannot be really directly assigned to the intra and extracellular compartments because um, people have been shown that also um, if we look at a single compartment with restricted diffusion, we have a similar decay curve and um, there is some ambiguity regarding the, the volume fractions in this case. Uh, another application for a bi-exponential decay is um, the intra-voxel um, coherent motion, which aims to separate the effects of uh, diffusion and perfusion uh, in order to look at the effect of the blood flowing through randomly oriented um, capillaries. And uh, in this case, uh, we will have a drop in the signal due to the flow at the, the very low uh, B values. We can uh, extend um, this approach to model anisotropic uh, slow and fast diffusion as well as to model uh, multiple fibers uh, from a hard data set if we have um, a multi-tensor model. So in this case, the, this model requires nonlinear fitting in order to extract the model parameters. And um, various constraints in special cases have been looked at in the literature because it is very difficult to fit um, all these model parameters. One such example is the ball and uh, stick model, which assumes an isotropic diffusion for the extracellular space and an anisotropic diffusion only along uh, the fibers inside the axons. And uh, such a model can be used with one or multiple um, uh, fiber tracts, and uh, of course, in, uh, when we have multiple fibers, we can also resolve um, uh, crossing uh, fiber, which affects the tractography results. Uh, then uh, the white matter tract integrity model um, uses, so basically it extracts uh, parameters regarding the volume fraction of the intraaxonal um, space from uh, the DKI parameters which are obtained via linear fitting in order to avoid this uh, uh, non-linear fitting of a multi-tensor uh, model. We can also go from a discrete uh, sum of tensors to a continuous uh, distribution and look at the distribution of tensors over directions as well as over the diffusivity values. And here are some examples from the literature. For example, the diffusion basis um, spectrum uh, imaging uh, 
uh, uses a discrete number of anisotropic compartments and the distribution of diffusivities. It is a very general model. Uh, however, in practice, uh, Van et al. have used it with uh, one anisotropic compartment and uh, three isotropic components. Another model which is gaining popularity is the diamond technique, which um, uses a distribution of tensors along uh, each main orientation, which you can see uh, nicely represented in, uh, in this diagram. However, if we really want to look at the generalized distribution of tensors with a distribution over both directions and diffusivities, uh, we really need uh, specialized diffusion acquisition such as uh, uh, Q-space trajectory imaging, and you'll hear more about this tomorrow afternoon. And the models that we have discussed uh, so far do not include uh, restricted diffusion. And uh, if we do uh, model the effect of cellular membranes, then we can uh, extract information regarding cellular size and shape from diffusion MRI data in order to improve the uh, specificity to uh, tissue microstructure. So some of the early uh, models in NMR have been proposed in the 90s and uh, is the model uh, from Stanich, which um, aims to describe the signal in the bovine optic nerve. It is a very uh, complex multi-compartment model that requires really um, rich and high quality um, ex vivo data set to fit these model parameters. So now the question is, is it feasible to apply such an analysis to um, like clinical in vivo imaging? So one of the first um, models that includes a restriction is the CHARM model, uh, the composite hindered and restricted uh, model of diffusion from Yanni Vasaf, which assumes a distribution of axon sizes. So we fix uh, the restriction size, and then it fits the orientation, diffusivities, and volume fractions. Then we can relax, oops, we can relax the uh, assumption of uh, known size and uh, um, Yanni Vasaf proposed the Excalibur model, uh, which uh, estimates a distribution of axon diameters from the measured data. Um, however, it assumes uh, that uh, the fiber orientation is known and the gradient direction is perpendicular to the fiber. And he got uh, really good uh, correlations between the Excalibur uh, measurements and electron microscopy. Uh, then um, Alexander et al. Uh, extended uh, this idea to a rotationally invariant uh, framework that can be applied in vivo and uses uh, four uh, B shells in order to estimate the axon diameter, index, uh, fiber or orientation, and um, intracellular volume fractions. However, if we look at um, the estimates that we get from uh, such approaches, we see that the diffusion based uh, estimates of axon diameter are overestimated compared to histology, especially when we are looking at um, clinical data sets. So uh, this brings to the question of what is actually the smallest axon diameter which we can distinguish from zero, that we can measure. And uh, we looked at uh, this um, question and tried to answer it in detail in uh, simulations. Uh, so we saw that basically um, the resolution limit of axon diameter depends on the gradient strength as well as on the signal to noise ratio. But if we look at clinical gradient strength, we see that actually the smallest axon we can estimate, even with a really good quality data, is around four microns. Well, if we go at larger gradient strength, we can go down to maybe uh, two microns. And um, this is much larger than the actual axon diameters in the brain because the majority of axons are smaller than two or uh, three microns in diameter. So what we are actually sensitive to is uh, the larger axons from the tail of, uh, of the distribution. But we, are also, um, we also have sensitivity to the axon size and their configuration from the extracellular space. And um, uh, Dmitry Novikov and Els Firman did a really great job in the trying to model uh, the extracellular space and extract information from it. And uh, this yields that um, actually the diffusivity in um, the extracellular space depends on the time um, and on the timing parameters of the sequence. And uh, this can also have an effect on the um, estimates of the axon diameter. So it is a really important effect that is. Um, 
overlooked in most of the techniques. Uh, then other models aim to um, basically uh, look at uh, the orientation uh, dispersion uh, because uh, the fiber dispersion is present uh, in um, the brain and we have a lot of fiber bending, fanning and undulation which uh, can cause this uh, dispersion. Uh, so one of the uh, first models is the neuroidensity density model uh, from Jesperson which assumes a distribution of sticks um, basically an isotropic diffusion and then hindered diffusion in the uh, extracellular space. And it has been used on a preclinical uh, rich acquisition. And we can see here that uh, such a model can much better distinguish between the different layers in the hippocampus compared to a DTI. Then uh, the Nodi technique uh, from uh, Gary Zhang uh, aimed to bring uh, this idea to the clinic and make it feasible um, to estimate the orientation uh, distribution from a two-shell uh, clinical acquisition and uh, it provides an explicit model of uh, the orientation distribution and it has been used in uh, many clinical applications. A different approach uh, is to basically factor out the effect of fiber orientation uh, from, uh, from the data. And uh, this is what uh, Kaden et al. have done in the spherical mean technique. So what they do, they fit a model with an isotropic distribution of cylindrically symmetric tensors to the data which is averaged over different um, gradient orientations. And they do this for at least two different uh, B values in order to obtain the diffusivities of uh, each uh, microdomain. And we can see that uh, from the SMT technique, we have like, a really high anisotropy in the entire um, white matter, which is not affected by the fiber dispersion as uh, the metrics from uh, DTI. Uh, this method can also be extended to uh, multi-compartments. And in this case, each um, microdomain consists of a stick and an anisotropic tensor. And such methods can also uh, provide the special uh, spatially variant deconvolution kernel in the spherical deconvolution approaches. So the methods that we have uh, seen so far make various assumptions regarding the diffusion uh, model in uh, each microdomain. But if we really want to disentangle between the more uh, complex uh, substrates, such as uh, randomly oriented elongated pores and isotropic pores with a distribution of sizes, we really need to look at um, diffusion gradients which uh, vary the orienta their orientation within one measurement. And there are many ways of doing this. Uh, for example, the Q-space trajectory uh, imaging, which combines um, directional and isotropic encoding and uh, these generalized gradients. Then we have the double diffusion encoding, uh, which uses uh, two pairs of um, diffusion gradients that can have uh, different orientations. And uh, we have also extended uh, this acquisition uh, to um, a double oscillating diffusion encoding in order to uh, measure the time dependence of uh, microscopic anisotropy uh, in the tissue. And uh, you'll uh, hear more about uh, uh, these sequences in the educational talk from uh, tomorrow afternoon, as well as in the scientific uh, sessions. So we can also apply similar ideas uh, to uh, modeling for uh, cancer imaging, not only for brain imaging. And in this case, the bi-exponential modeling can uh, be used at um, uh, medium and high B values to distinguish between the intracellular and extracellular components or at the low and medium B values in order to uh, measure the IVIM effect, which um, distinguishes between the tissue and, uh, and perfusion. And then uh, there are also models uh, that account for um, restricted diffusion, such as the restriction spectrum imaging, which extends a spherical deconvolution approach from uh, the brain and uses a set of functions for different restriction lengths and anisotropies. And then uh, they combine uh, the different model parameters in order to get a map of uh, cellularity, which is actually a really important metric if we look at, uh, at tumors. And they have applied this for both brain and uh, prostate cancer.
Uh, then we also have the verdict uh, model, which is a uh, three compartment model, which aims to account for the um, uh, vascular, extracellular, and uh, restricted uh, diffusion parts in the tumor. Um, and um, here I will show you an example in uh, prostate cancer. So we can see that the verdict uh, provides a more accurate representation of the signal uh, compared to the standard ADC and uh, IVIM. It also shows significant differences between uh, benign and malignant uh, areas, as you can see here. And also the parameters aim to reflect the microstructural uh, features, uh, such as um, a cellularity map. And um, there are lots of validation work uh, in um, like preclinical studies going on. So I have presented you various models of diffusion MRI, and as Els said, there are hundred, hundred more mod models uh, trying to, you know, represent a rich diffusion data set. And uh, these techniques have different modeling assumptions, uh, which are especially important for biophysical models. And multi-compartment models can also be very computationally demanding in terms of fitting the model to the data. Moreover, some of uh, the models can become degenerate, which means that different combination of parameters yield the same signal, especially when we have um, very noisy data. So it is very important to understand what are the fitting constraints, as well as the prior or fixed parameter values that are used in, uh, in the models. And the research studies really need to explicitly describe uh, all these aspects of um, the computational part. Uh, then the estimated parameters values might depend on the quality of the data as well as on the sequence parameters. So we always need to uh, be very careful when we compare the parameters from different studies or from I know, different uh, research centers. Also, the, in general, parameters really need to be interpreted with, uh, with care. So which model do I choose? Uh, it really depends on the application that you have in mind, on the acquisition requirements, on um, how long do you have to acquire data, and also if the model assumptions are um, appropriate for your study. Uh, so um, there is a lot of work uh, going on in diffusion MRI, and if you go to the uh, scientific sessions, you will see that uh, um, it is a very lively topic. So we're working on better modeling, to make the models more accurate and more specific, to include um, features such as um, axon undulation, permeability, uh, thickness of the myelin sheath, uh, diffusion in the extracellular space, etc. But also analytical models incorporating all these features are intractable sometimes, so uh, we are using machine learning approaches um, as well. Then we also want to fit the parameters uh, faster, so there are different ways of, uh, of doing this in order to um, you know, hopefully bring this to the clinic as soon as possible. We really need to estimate the parameters uh, really, really fast. So there is a nice educational talk on the um, analysis tissue and signal models tomorrow uh, afternoon. Then we are also working on better sequences such as the oscillating gradients to measure the frequency uh, dependence of a diffusion as well as the time dependence, as else mentioned. Then um, we're looking at sequences with varying gradient orientation to improve the specificity of the signal to disentangle microscopic anisotropy and size distribution. But we're also working a lot on uh, simulations, which can provide an in-depth understanding of the diffusion contrast for different sequences as well as different tissue models. And uh, there is a nice educational talk uh, tomorrow afternoon on uh, acquisition and uh, the advanced sequences. Well, thank you very much for your attention.